Hour number two, Jeff Cambridge, 93.3, Real Talk Radio, War Chant TV. Hope you're well on a Balls McWednesday. Uh, we didn't acknowledge it in the first hour, so I'll acknowledge it here. I did mention in the first hour that today's show is recorded because uh, kids have doctor's appointments, and I'm Mr. Mom today these days. By the way, I love that movie. Did you ever see Mr. Mom? Mr. Mom, no. That uh, who, who is the star? Uh, what's his face? Batman, the original Batman. Oh, Michael um, Keaton. Yeah, Michael Keaton. This is back in the 80s when Michael Keaton did a series of comedies. Uh, Night Shift, Mr. Mom, uh, some movie. I can't remember the name of the movie with the with the cars where he's working at a car dealership and they're shutting down. Um, he was hilarious. I mean, he that's how he got to start was oh, all comedies. He, he's funny. There, there was some speculation at one point that he would be brought back into the Batman universe as a Joker, like in a different way. And he would have been fun. Like, cause he's weird and he doesn't have to be Beetlejuice to be a Joker. Cause he can be dry and sinister. Also. He's that, that guy's got some quiet range to him. He's got a ton of range to him, man. Um, yeah, Bert. Yeah, man. He's, he was, he's a really good actor in spotlight. Uh, yep. he's really, really good in spotlight. By the way, uh, he Jack was in a movie Brown. called, Cle yeah, he was in clean and sober, uh, where he was an alcoholic and that's a great movie. By the way, Morgan Freeman is in that movie. Really good movie. I never saw Birdman. I heard it was good though. It was critically awesome. Good. Is it? It was. Yep. Yeah, and he's incredible in it, buddy. He's, he's, he's the truth. Yeah. He's really, really, really good. Also, I once listened to a long podcast with him. I believe Mark Maron was interviewing him and, uh, he's had an interesting life, he lost a wife, uh, like, like as in she died. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he also, uh, admitted to, uh, <laughs> frequently being caught in airports with massive dips in his mouth. <laughs> he said, he's like, I'm a celebrity and I don't like people to see me doing things that aren't healthy, but I really like a good dip. And a lot of times when I'm getting ready to fly to calm me down, I put a big dip in and invariably somebody will come up to me and I got a huge dip in my mouth. <laughs> And I just thought, well, that runs contrary to what I think Michael Keaton to be, right? <laughs> he also gave up quite a few roles to to be a dad as well. Um, yeah, he, he yeah. put his career on the back burner. Well, he made plenty of money. This is this is that that's something that that's a decision that you or I would do. It's why we don't pursue excellence, uh, like and uh, imbalance in life, like a like a head coach in football, for example. Right. Once you make your money, <clears throat> once you make that number, once that tried and true consulting uh, money comes in, you're gone. Yeah, buddy. You're done. Yeah. That's it. Once I cash that ticket, when tried and true is in every restaurant in town, you guys won't see the Jeff Cameron show anymore. That's it. I'm out. <laughs> there you go. Tried and true. Make it happen. Make it happen. Hey, I wanted to piggyback on something. We were talking about Scorigami and I meant to bring up something else that's relevant to that. And I just think these little notes that sometimes I jot away as I'm driving around or I hear it or I read it and then I put it in my show notes and I don't always get to everything. A lot of times I'm scatterbrained with this stuff. But did you know that a game could that could end six to one in six, football? Six to one? Uh huh. So here's how it could happen. Is okay. Drop, is there like a drop kick rule? What? No. It, see, that's what I thought too, Tom. And you know, in Canadian football, they have the rouge. You know yeah, that, right, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If a uh, if a point after so this goes back when the rule changed in 2015, and I don't know how I never noticed this. If a, if a point after touchdown, a PAT, is blocked, we know that a defensive player can scoop up the ball and run towards the other end zone, right? You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's two. What, are you telling me that's one, oh, not two? No, no, no. I, stay with me here. Oh, damn it. If he can advance it to the end zone, the defense earns, as you said, a two-point safety. But let's say – that exact scenario plays out. He picks it up. I put the, I wrote this down so that I would remember this scenario because it's crazy. Okay, so he he picks it up. He's racing towards the other end zone. The, the kicking team has a player pursuing him, chasing him towards that other end zone to prevent him from going across the line. Okay, if he knocks the ball out as he's tackling him before he crosses the line, and then the ball rolls into the end zone and he picks it up and tries to pursue it back down the other way across the other goal line so that they can get points after having that kick blocked, right? The play is not dead. The play is right, not dead. Right, right. If he tries to do that and is tackled in the end zone, his own end zone, an entire field away from where the team's lined up for the kick, the 
the, 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 the defense, not the team that just scored the touchdown and kicked the PAT, would earn a single point at the end of all of that play. So, so it's like a one point safety, is what you're saying. It's a one point safety. So oh, wow. I block your kick. Yep. You're pissed. I pick it up. I'm running to the end zone to get my two points. You're like, no, no, you're not. And you chase me. Now you happen to catch me at the one yard line and you knock the ball out and you say, suck it, Jeff. You're not getting those two points. But then it hits you. Oh, the ball is in the end zone. It's free and the play is not dead. I'm going to pick it up and run. And I go, oh, no, Tom Lang, you're not running back down there. And then I tackle you and you hit some. Then it's a one point safety. <laughs> so does that mean that there's been a six to one game in NFL history? No. Right. Okay. All right. It's never happened. Okay. But it could happen. It could I mean, happen. That's something that you would have seen uh, on the uh, the black and white film on, on a mud-covered canvas of a football right. field in Cleveland in 1922. Like, you could see that happening. 100%. Most of the strangest results or plays or weird scores in NFL history – are all some nonsense when the game was burgeoning. Nobody could throw a forward pass, and it was just a, a muddy mess of a scrum back and forth and guys falling on their own goal line and yeah. another guy kicking a 20-yard field goal and winning 3-2. to two. What like, a play you know, like, yeah. yeah, Pappy O'Monahan with the play. Like, yep, yeah, all right. Pappy O'Monahan was great. Another big play from Pappy O'Monahan, his third catch of the day. Pappy's feeling it today, guys. There have only been five completed passes this year, the season, 1937. Five completed passes. Three of them are to Pappy O'Monahan. <laughs> what hands? He's got unbelievable hands. It's because Pappy he, worked O'Monahan. The, he worked the steel mill from age nine to age 22 before they discovered him in a lunch break. He was smoking unfiltered, uh, smoking unfiltered lucky strikes at the age of eight and said, uh, coal mine, man. Go back if you go to like websites like Cora, or if you just look at uh, you uh, you know Google Images and type in like child labor 1915, you'll find some amazing pictures as to how these laws were enacted to protect children. Think about what kind of an adult had to live back then: a jaded, angry, always wearing a damn suit, even though it's 98 degrees outside, smoking, frustrated adults who found it in their heart to make a six-year-old go down in the coal mines and go to work. Like, they're like, yeah, my life sucks. I'm going to be dead by 30. We can put six-year-olds to work. Screw it. Well, they're Screw damn. They're, they're closing in on middle age at that point. You know, like, here you go. Here's here's an image. Look at that. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> there's, so, there's worse ones than that where you're like, oh, man. Hey, got kids out here laying brick. At like seven. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I got I got one for you. I'm, I'm pulling it now. Uh, this is uh, the license is from Alamy, so I got to do all that kind of stuff, and there'll be a watermark on it. This is 1911 in South Piston, Pennsylvania, and this mm. is a collection. This is like a union's worth of kids. By the way, South Piston sounds like a tough place to grow up. There you go. There's Look the child. That. Yeah, they're going to work, buddy. They're That's going about, to work. What do you think? I'm doing a quick count here. Probably about 65, 70 kids for the people yeah. on the podcast. Holy yeah. smokes. South Piston. Where are you from, South Piston? Jesus. Really? Yeah. It was tough. Yeah. You, there are not a lot of frills in South Piston. Oh, no. You, you, grew, up, you grew up tough in South Piston, buddy. Uh, we knew what we were early on. Couple I was five out there hammering nails with my dad. Couple of sips of ale, you'll be fine, son. Yeah, yeah. Rub okay, some dirt on it. Rio in South Piston. That's a that's a tough time. Tough time. Florida State. There you go. There's the segue. Florida State. More than two hundred and thirty yards passing this weekend, Tom. Oh, two thirty. Mm, mm, mm. It's a toughie, isn't it? It is. You said a, a decent number because I. I Here's the here's why Memphis and their secondary gave cushions to Troy on the level that TCU did to Colorado last year in the season opener when yeah, which was frightening. frightening. That's to Troy. So if Florida State just wants to snap the ball and play pitch and catch to the perimeter, I think they can do it all day. Um, I like where Florida State can can win in the trenches. Uh, so it's like. I really feel like this is a 400, 450 plus put uh, yard output game coming. I'll go over. 
I'll go over because that secondary looks awful from Memphis. Now, go watch us struggle, and I'll say, I guess Troy's got a better offense than we do in the postgame show on Monday. But, I mean, that that Memphis secondary looks um, very beatable. Very beatable. I'm with you that this sets up nicely for Florida State's offense. I agree with you. From what I've seen, I think Florida State should be able to move the ball. I think the real concern heading into this game is Florida State's defense against Memphis's offense. Now, Florida State has taken turns in two games in which you could lay the bulk of the blame at the feet of the other. In the first game, you could really talk a lot about, in my mind, uh, how it was that the the defense just could not could, – I mean, they, 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 were, they were beat to the perimeter – uh, they, they couldn't tackle uh, worth a damn. Uh, they struggled mightily in really most every facet of defensive football. The linebacker play was an abomination. The safeties were non-existent, et cetera. In fact, it got a safety benched after that game. So, you know, we, we, you already saw telltale signs of problems um, after game one. Game two, I lay the feet at the feet of the offense. Now, I get it. The defense wasn't good, especially to start the game. They couldn't get off the field on third down because Boston College had a lot of third and manageables. You could argue about a lack of toughness once again from this defense. I think that's been omnipresent uh, for a couple games now. But they did get their arms around that offense eventually, and it's not like Boston College lit them up through the air at all. And as you have correctly pointed out at least 10 times, Mike Norvell going for it on fourth down was a poor decision. I agree with you there. But the offense was the real problem in general. Uh, I thought in this game, last game because they had no identity, no game plan. DJ was awful. The receivers were awful. Obviously, Morlock was awful. Um you know, they, 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 they couldn't run the ball to save their life, even when it was a neutral box. So time and again, my frustration this past game was with the offense. Going into this game, this offense had better move the ball against that Memphis team for all the reasons you've correctly pointed out. They have a soft secondary. They're not stout up front. They run a 3-3-5, which I loathe. Anyhow, you ought to be able to move the line of scrimmage in your favor in this game straight ahead. You ought to be able to do that, and if the corners are going to play off against Florida State, then the quick game needs to be in play, and let's let some athletes make some you know, plays. You brought in all this speed. Hakeem Williams is back as a big time blocker out on the edge there. You also have him for the big plays down the field for contested catches. Everything should change this week for this offense. I'm not saying it's going to be a juggernaut because I don't think that line is ever going to be this year a plus offensive line, but it doesn't have to suck. Yeah, there's a couple of notes on that offensive line. Uh, the running, the run blocking is not good. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the numbers will tell you that when they pass pro, they're excellent at it. When they don't, it's instant pressure, instant pressure, because Florida State is bottom 10 in the country in quarterback pressure rate. However, DJU's average time to throw is as good or maybe a little bit better than it was at Oregon State. It's close to three seconds, It's 2.7, whatever, 2.8 seconds. That's a lot of time, actually. So what that tells you is when they're good at it, he has all day. When they're poor at it, he it has pressure instantly in his face. And you saw that a bunch, obviously, in the Boston College game, uh, mostly from the left side. Where, where yeah, the Darius got was. abused. This was a highlight reel tape for the kid from Boston College defensive end who did anything and everything he wanted to Darius in that game. Um, it, it got so bad that it made me feel bad watching it. Like, I thought, oh, man, this is – we shouldn't be able to see this. This should be behind a paywall. Lord Darius is just – this is – this is no good. This is no good. And it's just like that with Robert Scott on the other side, by the way. When they're forced to play him, buddy, I, I'm sorry. I've said it two years now. A, he's not been healthy for two years. B, when he plays, it's it's minimal. Um, when he is out there, uh, he gives a lot of effort. He's, he's always going to try hard, and I appreciate that about him. And he was once a really good player. He's shot, man. He can't play. He can't play. And you can't keep putting them out there. I blame the coaches for that. You can't keep putting them out there. I don't care how much love you have for somebody. If they can't block, you got to get them off the field. You're getting your quarterback into a place where he's losing confidence by the second. Uh, your two tackles are a big reason for that. Uh, back to the point about Memphis really quick. Uh, if you have a worry, it's about their offense against your defense. This is, this is two fingers to my eyes, two fingers back to you, Adam Fuller, back to you, Randy Shannon, back to you in the secondary, back to you on the edges, back to all of you guys. Let's grow up now. 
let's get to communicating and let's be physical. Let's play downhill. Let's hit some folks and get them on the ground and let's go. You're going to give up some points because you're not great, but you know, we have to give up a ton and you can get off the damn field on third down. Yeah. One thing that Memphis has not seen this year is a challenge on the outside with the, I mean, they're facing North Alabama and Troy. So, I mean, that right. that's, there are limiting factors there, but they have not seen a challenge to their receivers in terms of space. And so what Hennigan, the quarterback has been content to do is either take those quick hitch routes, quick comeback routes because of the cushion that is being given in those situations. He's also not afraid to dink and dunk his way down the field. Uh, their first touchdown drive might have been their second one against Troy, 14 play drive, right? So that's exactly what we've seen all too much of in our first two games, 12 play drives, yeah. 16 play drives, six minutes comes off the clock, nearly eight minutes comes off the clock. It's straight out of an Army Navy drive summary in a box score. You're like, damn it. You know, so... They're content to do that, but if you get downhill here and you're not soft on the edges, as Adam Fuller said, he didn't say it with that much vigor in the word soft, but if you play physically, again, th this is a game where I'm looking at the trenches, and I get it. Florida State has been woeful in the trenches the first two games. This is a step down. The, the competition level is a step down on both lines of scrimmage. They've got a good quarterback who knows where to go with the ball. They'll have a plan that they have not broken out. Memphis has not broken out all of their tricks for Florida State. They will break them out this weekend. You'll see some things, I'm sure, that look very similar to Tech, very similar to Boston College, but all the same. You know, they could score how many points? What's the race to here? The race should be to 21, 24. 24. Fair. Okay, so Memphis drops 20, 21 on you. All right, so that means they have a lot of success on a few drives and maybe a couple other others that stall. So they move the ball. Just three not sevens. Get those. Get off the field on third down. Let's not start six of seven the wrong way on defense on third downs. Red mm -hmm. zone, we've been abysmal. Let's hold them to three every once in a while. They, just because you get in the red zone doesn't mean you should always be able to score a touchdown or put your knee in the ground when the game is over because you run the clock out. Like all these things, these situations that Florida State has been poor at, I do think like you do. This offense should produce finally. So if the race is to 21 or 24, yeah, I, I think we should be able to get to that margin in the upper 20s, lower 30s. But they've got to go execute because morale can also come into this equation in a way that we're not talking about right now. Confidence, morale, one kid drops a pass on our first third down again and we're punting and we're already down three to nothing. Like right. That kind of stuff can create the, the scenario that makes Memphis play bigger than the sum of their parts and us lesser than the sum of our parts. And that's how we got to this place at 0 2. Florida State is a six and a half point favorite in this game against Memphis. I know it's not Redemption Thursday, but just a heads up on that. By the way, I will give it away already. I'm going to be on the uh, War Chant Report uh, where we'll make our predictions. But I'll tell you right now, I've got Florida State winning this game 31 21, Tom. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I, I think you should cover this spread and you should win comfortably. There's a chance. And I think you agree with me. We'll gloss over this very quickly. There's a chance and I, I get it. I could be way off here for the reasons that you gave this could spiral again. If they get off to a poor start, the woe is me element is very much in play. Um, when your psyche is hanging on by a string. Uh, anything bad happens. I talk about it all the time. Need good things to happen to you early when you're fragile, when, when you're, when you're hanging on the edge and you're not real sure that you're good. You need some proof that you can execute and make plays and be the player you think you are. So let's hope they get off to a good start. But if they do, if Florida state gets off to a good start, I think the Knowles could blow Memphis out, Tom. I think the Knowles could blow Memphis out. It's within the range of possibilities. Um, and I, I agree with you. Like if, if I knew for a fact that they would care, I mean, that, how damning is that? But well, if, very I, damning. if I knew for a fact that they would care, that they would play physically, um, and, you know, they could still have busts, you know, but, but if they care on Saturday, it's it's a distinct possibility for it to happen, but they got the give a bleep factor has to be there, and it hasn't been. So, hopefully, whatever conversations needed to be had there, whatever personnel decisions that needed to be made between game two and game three have happened. Um, but if they if they care to show up and be 
anything close to their potential in terms of physicality. I'm not even talking about – there's going to be mistakes. They don't have to play perfect football. No, if they, just, no. if they right, play right, tough right. football, they're going to be in a position to win this game comfortably. But they've got to do it. They've got to show it. They've got to prove it at this point. My man Shannon Young, loansfornoles.com. He works with the Fairway Independent Mortgage Corporation. Uh, Shannon's a huge knoll. Gives a lot of money to the Battles End as well. A lot of great businesses that we've collaborated with. You can see Shannon Young right there, loansfornoles.com. Great guy. Hard, hardworking guy. Very smart guy. Falling interest rates. If you have a credit card debt, you're paying high interest rates. And uh, listen, you're considering possibly home improvements, all those things. Give Shannon a call today. He just saved a borrower over $2,000 a month by using the equity in their home to pay off debt and increase their credit score over 100 points. Loansfornoles.com. Shannon Young, loansfornoles.com. Jeff Cameron Show 93.3 Real Talk Radio and War Chat TV. I don't know that anybody has had a greater turnaround. Eh, I don't know if that's true either. That's a bit hyperbole I'm guilty of there. I, I don't know that I've grown from, uh, have gone from detesting somebody to kind of like really liking them in a long time. It happens in the sports world. It can happen in the entertainment world in general. You could be uh, a young actor that annoys me for whatever reasons. You're in a bunch of stupid movies. You're, 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 you're not that talented. And somewhere along the way, you figure it out. You take on better roles. And by the time you're at middle age, I think the world of you. You know, um, Matthew McConaughey kind of fits in that, that realm, right? Mm. Kind of a clown rom-com guy for years. And then all of a sudden, other than... Dazed and um, other yeah. than dazed and confused had largely been in a bunch of vapid stupid movies and yeah. really he was on, was he was on the uh, the j-lo and kate hudson yeah. circuit yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 kind of just a clown show you didn't really have any respect for and then one day you know he's doing true detective in a series of incredible movies in which he actually has to carry it as an actor and does and actually now is kind of interesting is an interesting person right <laughs> so it can happen right it can happen it happens a lot in sports uh, famously on this show, both you and I went from loathing Steve Smith to, as a player, really respecting him. Now, I still think he's an idiot, but I do think as a player, I grew to respect the hell out of him. Tough as nails, crazy long career, always showed up in big games, you know, played hurt, just like a lot of things that you go, eh, kind of like Steve Smith. Yeah. yeah, if you're in the locker room, you're like, hey, I've got to I got to put my headphones on enough, my, my noise cancelers, because I don't know what the hell he's talking about. But I do know on Sunday he'll be there. And he'll, I be know there. That he'll not just be there. He'll be there more than anybody else in this damn locker room. Yeah. Well, yeah, and he'll show up and he'll take it to the other team's best player. And he's just, yeah, there's a lot of things like Steve's about that action. And you, you're yeah, like, right. okay, I got you, Steve Smith. Yeah, that, I'm with you, buddy. Um, but you know who the latest candidate is, and it's been happening for more than a year now, and I think it's a completely successful overhaul of perception. Uh, you got a guess? Ryan Braun? God, no. <laughs> Thankfully, hey, that stupid ass is no longer even in baseball. Hey, man, remember how when he bet his life on uh, and blamed a father and a son, we felt bad for Aaron Rodgers. You're like, man, you trusted the wrong guy as a friend. And now he's gone the other way. Look Aaron's at that. gone the other way. It yeah. makes perfect sense that those dudes were friends. It makes perfect sense. Now it does. Now knowing what we know about Aaron, it does. But we didn't know that for a long time. And then all of a sudden, more and more it got revealed. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, okay, Aaron. A little too dysfunctional to keep it together with Olivia Munn, you, you don't say. Oh, that's, that's a red flag right there and a half. Well, she was beautiful. What a dumbass. I, I don't know how you ruined that one. That's right. that's Run tough to Dan one. Patrick. Okay, whatever. Yeah, that's really strange. No, the answer is Lane Kiffin. No. <laughs> Lane Kiffin is not only now somebody that I kind of like, I think I really like Lane Kiffin, and he did it again yesterday, everybody. He is crushing Paul Feinbaum around every turn whenever he gets an opportunity, and he added him yesterday on X with the, what are you good at again? Uh, after he posted a clip of Feinbaum saying, there is no chance that Auburn can lose to Cal. None. Book it. 
that's that's the clip that Feinbaum uh, had, and then Lane taking that clip, posting it, adding him. What are you good at again? After in the off season, providing one of the more uncomfortable yet satisfying moments we've seen in media in some time uh, by sitting right next to him and ripping him for a good five minutes on his own show as Feinbaum had that nervous little kid smile. I just broke the lamp and you know it, but I'm lying to you and I'm going to stare away from your eyes because I know you know that I'm lying to you. Look on his face. That that was that whole interaction. There was a lot of shame in, in Paul Feinbaum's presence in that moment. And, and Lane Kiffin made him feel the shame. And there was nobody that could help him. And I even feel like the truck and his producers decided not to help him because there's, you could have acted 10 seconds quicker and been the yes. referee in the boxing match and, and stuck your hands in the way and said, we're done here. And then hug the combatant who is being beaten to death to save their life as many a boxing referee has done. And they let it go an extra few ticks. Well, I think, that's they very do- telling. I think that's very telling. Well, it's like the producer in the in uh, in in Nashville that let the Titans lineman walk over and just start to unload on the host. And that picture of that <laughs> look at that guy. If you're not on War Chant TV, you can't see this, but that's, that's Buck Rising, by the way. The yeah, Buck Rising. Buck- <laughs> <laughs> that producer sitting next to him is just like, oh, I'm gonna enjoy this. <laughs> That is a big man walking our direction. (laughs) It's about damn time. Old Buck Rising has said some dumbass things over the years, and he's going to get called on the carpet. You know, the one thing they didn't show there was him turning his shoulder and looking at Buck like, well, what do you think, (laughs) Buck? I can't imagine that moment for Buck as he's sitting there, whatever he's saying there, they're at camp and he sees the guy that he has said some things about. Notice him, first of all, at a distance, right? Because you know it's in the back of his head. You know he's like, oh, man, that's yeah, that's uh, whatever, you know, Jerry Smith, whoever. He, I can't remember the player. And then he's just like, oh, he's, he's walking. Okay, this is not good. He's coming straight here. Okay, I got to pretend like I don't care. I'm going to keep talking. Oh, he's getting closer. This is, oh, this isn't good. And now you got a producer going, oh, okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> like the thing, all those years ago, um, when Jim Everett attacked Jim Rome, the only thing I ever gave Jim Rome credit for was in the moment knowing he had no choice. He had to say it again. He had to say it again and knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. He knew he also knew it would get broken up, but he knew there was a good chance this guy's coming across the table. Yes. And- also in that moment, I'm sure this is not something I would ever do personally. Um, not for fear of the other guy, but just because it's small time. I don't know. It's just, you got to have yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. He was willing to trade a broken jaw for the fame that was going to come with it. That's oh, why sure. in any given Sunday, McGinley's wearing the neck brace. And like, I mean, the, right. he is willing to go there because he knows that the, the payoff literally is huge in that moment. So you're fearless. And some guys have in a way that has a spine in a way it's spineless. But like yeah, Feinbaum, yeah. Feinbaum would never go there because Feinbaum's been challenged and he doesn't choose to double down. He chooses to shut his mouth because, well, you know, coward. Paul is five foot six, 105 pounds. Jim Rome's not much bigger, but yeah, but Jim, that's it. Jim was willing to, like, in that moment, all right, now you're questioning whether or not I'm going to be tough in front of you rather than tough behind the microphone in a room away from you. Jim's like, well, I got to do it now. I've got this. Gotta, yeah, you have to do it. You and have to do I, it. And Feinbaum's like, I'm, what do you mean? I never said that. You know, <laughs> that's the energy that he brings. We're friends. Well, I thought we're friends here. Oh, yeah, that was something. That was something. That's um, that's a tough one, man. That's Yeah, you see it coming and you're like, I did say that, didn't I? Okay, going to have to wear this one. I mean, I've had uncomfortable conversations, including – very uncomfortable conversations with uh, our former head coach at Florida State um, more than once, more than once. But, I mean, if you're going to criticize, you have to be willing to have that conversation, right? And it's different criticizing as opposed to maybe lampooning them, you know, physically like Jim was talking about Jim Everett. They called him Chris Everett. Yeah, right, 
Right. Yeah. You're you're not, you know, you didn't call Jimbo by like some name yeah. like that. Yeah. Like right, right, right. No, I just said that uh, look at Jane Fisher here. You know what I mean? Like you right, know, right, right, yeah. No, I, I didn't I didn't do that. No. Um and and the thing that he was the things that he were was always mad at me about were things that you know were true things that happened like he, he's mad that I said that this happened well it did happen man we one of them the whole stadium saw <laughs> yeah what are you talking about um, yeah so you can't anyhow uh, but kudos to Lane Kiffin who I think has made the complete transformation it's uh, Steve Spurrier did too at the end of his career still doing it. Still loving Steve. Yeah, the, every once in a while he'll remind you why you hate him. Uh, but for the most part, he's pretty funny. For the most part, he's he pretty funny. funny. Like he's yeah. he's he's the genuine article. That's who he is, for better or worse. And in those worst moments, you're like, you are just a small individual who can't let anything go. But I really love when you know you decide to turn that whatever that rage is that you have or those unresolved issues at uh, I don't know Florida and saying that. My alma mater sucks again, and you, you're the look of that he has in the in the suites that he's sitting in, where he's disgusting. Oh, it's hilarious! Yeah. Yeah. Calls him. This guy, he's crying. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Jordan's got a great story. I, I I've kind of told the story before. Uh, he told me about it on the golf course one day, and one other time when I was just talking with him. He's a great conversationalist. Um, but he's you know when he got the invite by Steve Spurrier to come to camp for the Tampa Bay Bandits. And Steve Spurrier is the coach of the Tampa Bay Bandits, very successful coach of the Tampa Bay Bandits. Um, and in the the gist of that story, and I'll let Jimmy do it one time. We'll have him on the show to do it. Is that um, Steve was the fairest guy in the world regarding that quarterback battle because he was there battling with a Gator for the backup role. And Jimmy thought, well, how am I ever going to get an honest shake here? I mean, you know. And it was a close battle. And yet Steve went with Jimmy and, and, and to this day still sends him Christmas cards and Thanksgiving cards and stuff like that. Like he's, 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 he's kind of the real thing. Like you just said, he's like, he's, he's the real dude, but he's also a guy that many people have told me stories about at charity golf tournaments that ruthlessly chides people in like pro-ams. Yeah. <laughs> like he's that kind of competitive yeah yeah i've got an uncle that's like well it was the uncle that's the athletic director at georgetown this is how you get to those places you you go there because he was a competitive mm -hmm. runner and, and he worked with the olympic team in 1980 on the on the summer side of course uh because they used to play they used to do those things concurrent um yeah you know he beat me in in like uh what do you call it bat horse he beat me in horse i'm seven years old and he's pointing <laughs> in my face like, oh man, you got you got problems, dude. You, and the problem is, you don't know it at seven. It's years later when you're older. Oh, you're like, what geez. the hell were you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I figured it out by the time I was in, I was a teen, and, and we went golfing together. And he quit after nine. We were supposed odds to play. That that's funny, by the way. Odds that strike me as odd going into this weekend's set of games. Oregon is a sixteen and a half point favorite over a ranked Oregon State team. Strikes me as odd. Boston College is a 16 and a half point underdog against Missouri. You think that's more lopsided? You think Missouri wins that game by a lot more than that? Uh, I think there's a chance. I think that I think there's a distinct chance there. There's a lot of stuff that's open against Boston College that basic stuff we didn't execute. Now, the limiting factor there is they didn't break out Castellanos. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe they've got some stuff that they didn't need to run. They're like, oh, God, we can save it for Mizzou. We didn't need it last week. Michigan is only a 23-point favorite against Arkansas State. That'll tell you what Vegas thinks of that offense. 23-point favorites against Arkansas State? That's it? I think, I think they figured that one properly about Michigan's offense, yeah. This one strikes me as odd. Arizona State and Dillingham, who's doing a really good job, is only a one and a half point favorite over Texas State tomorrow. Mm. One and a half point favorite over Texas State. Doesn't that strike you as odd? That's got to be about some kind of injuries. That has to be. I'm going to do my due diligence before yeah. we arrive at Redemption Thursday's show because that is begging for all of us to take Arizona State. Mm. And if that's the case, that's usually not a good idea. If the that's public is going to overwhelmingly jump on Arizona State, yeah, I get the same spidey sense as an NFL sucker line. That that feels like an there are some college lines where you're like, oh, that's curious.
But the NFL ones, they just they slap you in the face and dare you, and they just stare at you right in the eyes. You're like, come on, bet it. Come on, please. I want you to. I need you to. You don't understand why Anthony Richardson and the Colts are only two and a half point dogs at San Francisco, but I know why they are. Come on. <laughs> and, then, and then Indianapolis beats San Francisco by 10, and you're like, what? How did that happen? That's what that line smells like. I successfully took uh, Indianapolis in the two and a half against uh, Houston, by the way, or three and a half, whatever I was getting last week. That It was that crazy stat about home uh, underdogs within the division in week one. Uh, yeah, I was sitting at an 80% clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I just went with it blindly because of that. I was like, well, I mean, there has to be something to that. I'm going to do it. And lo and behold, I might have got a little lucky, but it worked out. Uh, guys, if you'd like, you can get a crop mop with your order. It's free. It's going to be thrown in as a treat. I'll tell you about that in a second. I'm talking, of course, about Manscaped manscaped.com and you get 20% off and free shipping with the code warchant 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com use the code warchant uh this is a a moist towelette made specifically for the boys and a lot of things being made for the boys these days which is a good thing and it's kind of been led by manscaped you've got the the lotion you've got the crop preserver you got the crop soother you got the weed whacker which is a little less soothing sounding, but nonetheless very effective for your nose hair, your ear hair. You got to tidy up uh, uh, tidy up the face, man. Get it done. Get it done and save a bunch of money while you're at it. 20% off and free shipping with the promo code WARCHANT at manscaped.com. It's Jeff Cameron, Show 93.3, Real Talk Radio, WARCHANT TV. This is normally something I would throw in next hour. We're coming up on next hour, but I did want to make mention of this. We might be able to carry it over for hour number three. Uh, YouTube sports rights efforts uh, may have already reached their apex. That according to John Cruz, who is the head of global sports partnerships for YouTube. Uh, most media companies are constantly chasing the next big thing. I'm quoting from said article here. Uh, and YouTube itself continues to be open to new sports opportunities. The 2022 acquisition of NFL Sunday ticket in a seven-year, $14 billion deal marks an important culmination of where the Google-owned outlet has been instead of just an early signpost of where it's going. Quote, what gave us the confidence to go out and get Sunday ticket was the fact that we had been working on highlights with the NFL on YouTube for nearly a decade at that point. The fact we had built up a lot of reps with a pay TV subscriber base via YouTube TV and had engaged advertisers across both of those services. All that pre-work that we did has laid the foundation on which Sunday ticket sits as opposed to the opposite. Gaining the NFL's residential out-of-mark rights has been a significant driver to the overall YouTube business. YouTube TV is now the number four U.S. pay TV service with more than 8 million subscribers. By 2026, YouTube TV is projected to be the number one uh, uh, driver of YouTube business and TV service, pay TV service, according to research done by uh, Moffat Nathanson. Uh, as it continues to grow, Linear carries in front of it, Charter, Comcast, DirecTV are all in a state of decline currently. It's been an important pillar for our overall business, bringing in Sunday Ticket to our platform that's enabled us to have the most comprehensive NFL offering of any distributor. They plan on doing more. They want to take over all of the things, Tom, including yep. they want to tell Amazon to suck it. They want to tell Hulu to suck it. They want to tell Peacock to suck it. They want to tell all of them. You know. We're taking all the games, buddy. Yeah, well, uh, look, the, in terms of the user experience, uh, there's a reason why that they're they're climbing. And and I've seen what Hulu's interface looks like. It's okay at best. Um, yeah. I've had Sling for parts of the season because they get a couple of networks that YouTube TV does not, uh, namely NHL Network. Um, I enjoy watching those post games in the postseason. So I've, watched, I've seen what Sling's product is. Not bad. YouTube TV's product is the best. And this is again. It, we've done a few of these segments where it sounds like it's an endorsement. I wish it was. I wish it was. I'd like. Well, to maybe it will. Up. Maybe it will be at some point. Yeah. But I mean, that is. It's. It's almost like what what Gatorade is to sports drinks, and Noel fans cringe about it. But like, man, it's it's synonymous with the sports drink. What Coca Cola is to soda, 
YouTube is to video streaming or video content on the internet. And what they're trying to do is make that the same way with the streaming service. Um, it is an outstanding product. It's extremely reliable. It's how I watch the Florida State games, and there's little to no but as long as you got good internet, like their their back end structure is good, which is interesting because I don't know if you saw NFL Plus, which was rolled out again this year. It crashed on Sunday in the one o'clock window. Ooh, now, no, 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 no. I, I told you, like, so my NFL loving nephew loves the NFL, specifically he loves the Raiders because of the, the, the colors and the logo. So he's yeah. latched onto them. And he, that's his team now is, is the Raiders. He wanted <laughs> NFL. He wanted NFL plus. So I got him NFL plus for a gift. And then the first week he's like, Hey, can you see if it's working? I'm like, Oh no. And sure enough, I go, the first thing I do is I go to X and they're saying NFL plus down. I'm paying $15 a month. Get your bleep together. NFL plus YouTube TV doesn't have that happen, but the NFL plus did. And yet they're the provider of the NFL stuff at YouTube. What is NFL plus? Specifically, what is it? So it, it basically, if you don't want to have Red Zone and and um, NFL, and NFL Net, well, no, no, no. If you don't want to have Red Zone and NFL Network attached to your current cable plan, you get access to that. You get access to all twenty-two. You oh get well, no, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Good. So they've done that before with the all twenty-two package that you could pay for. Like it's all rolled into one now, where you get NFL Network at all times, Red Zone, and then also what they used to do if you had Verizon. Like where you would get the primetime games on your right, phone for right, free. Right, right. Now yeah. they're making everybody pay for it. But he doesn't have red zone. And and he is of that generation where they want stimulation at all times. So he wanted red zone in the worst way. That's why I got him NFL Plus. I'm going to be very curious. This is just me talking out loud uh, in a short segment. What the next generation of football fan sounds like when discussing the game as they enter their late 20s and early 30s. My son is now a junior at Leon. Um, he's a, he's a starter at wide receiver. He's, he's more active in the offense than, than maybe I ever thought he was going to be. He's doing, he's doing good things. Uh, I bring that up not to brag. I bring it up because what it's done is sparked an interest. Well, it's a humble brag, but, <laughs> but the truth is I, I've noticed what it's done. It's, it's made him uh, in a, an active watcher of football in a way that he never was it was always on in the background he checked the score he goes to every Florida State game but now that he is in an offense and is being relied upon as a receiver within the offense certain concepts he understands uh, a lot of what uh, he's looking at now on the screen like what they're trying to accomplish what the concepts are right and we watch games together now, and it's very interesting. We'll watch every play. Like, we watched every play of the Jacksonville-Miami uh, game last weekend. And he was asking me certain questions about the defensive scheme. And I would I was peppering him with questions to see where he was at in his understanding. Well, he I don't watch Red Zone. Obviously, we have it, but I don't watch it because I it, it, it really – I don't like it, first of all. But secondly – if there is a generation of kids that only watch red zone and that does not give you an understanding of football whatsoever. And so I'm very curious for the ones that grow up doing that. Will they know the game? Yeah. Will they know the game or will they only know the fantasy aspect of the game? Because that's what red zone's good for. Well, I, I think two things and I, I know we're up against it, but you know, there are people who are diehards. There will always be diehards. I, I think what you're, you, you, there's a lot of casuals who I think will be smarter. Think about the general fan. The general fan just wants yeah. to be entertained. I, I think it just takes a different form. But there's now greater access to be a diehard and a knowledgeable fan than ever before. So there, there's both. I think there's both. That is true, too. Yeah, it, it could offset. If you want to go down that road to understanding the game more, you absolutely have access you to things we never did that, that was never yeah. available to you. You had to watch no. Edge, uh, at, you know, Gillette yeah. NFL matchup in, in at yeah. 5 a.m. With, with Jaws. <laughs> Which was awesome. Hour number three, fourth coming. Stay with Jeff Cameron, show 93.3 Real Talk Radio, War Chant TV.